Welcome back, everybody. WHIP Radio in Philadelphia. It's Zach Gelb and Mike Zahn here with you rolling along for another 20 minutes is the time in the WHIP studios is 1140. Now joining us is someone that was on the sidelines last night for the big UNC win, and then she did some work this morning for CBS, and that is a very tired, I'm sure, Dana Jacobson who joins us right now. Dana, Zach, and Mike in Philly, thanks for a few minutes, and how are you? My pleasure. I'm, I'm nearing that time to crash phase, but I'm doing great. Thank you. Well, I'm actually shocked you came on with us. I would have went to bed instead of coming on with us. <laughs> but uh, take us through that schedule. Last night, the final buzzer sounds. You do some post-game work, and then just take us through what was a crazy night for you. Well, we waited for Mike Bray. He went and did some media first and then came back to talk to us and uh, headed out from Philly. I want to say it was close to midnight by the time we got, we got on the road and Came back to New York, got uh, about 90 minutes of sleep, and uh, came in this morning to do CBS this morning. But it was this amazing opportunity, so there was no way I was going to say no. And all week long, we've had a lot of announcers on, and we asked them, because you have all these games going on, and there's multiple games and announcers that all have their special tricks to really keep that energy up. Tom McCarthy was telling us he drinks a lot of coconut water and licorice uh, in between the broadcasts. We had Mike Doc Emmerich on last week, and his big thing is always peanut butter. Is there anything you do special to keep that en energy up on air? You know, for me, when I'm on air, I'm just on adrenaline anyway because it, I don't know where it comes from. That's just how I've always been. So I feel like I have that going. I'm a coffee drinker. I certainly, that first weekend, um, the first day on our Friday when you've got your four games, I had a lot of coffee, a lot of water, and then honestly, like making sure that the night before you get a decent amount of sleep has sort of been my trick for the last two years, sort of. But I say decent amount of sleep, and that means like make sure you get five or six hours instead of not getting any. So. <laughs> We're talking to Dana Jacobson, who joins us right now. So let's get to that UNC game last night that you were doing the sideline reporting for. Um, after the game, I was actually uh, pretty surprised when Roy Williams said that he wanted this group to get to the Final Four more than any other team that he coached because of all the criticism that they have taken over the last four years. Were you at all surprised at that when you were uh, talking to this UNC team? Because it seems like that really motivates them. Well, I had talked to him, um, obviously, the whole time we've been there. So I talked to him a little bit on Thursday, and I had a sit-down interview with him on Saturday where he went a little more into it. Um, I don't know if I was surprised. I was surprised at the tone that he took with it, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but you know, him speaking on just his integrity being questioned and then for the entire team to have that sort of looming, um, what I really enjoyed it. I don't remember if he said it exactly in the post game, but he kept telling me in, in the previous interviews about how when they got together as a team, whether it was practice or game, for all of them it was the time to just escape from any of the negative talk. And you can believe what you want to believe about what happened at North Carolina and involvement, but put that aside. Just know for those kids and for that coach in that moment, they were able to just go play basketball. And he's talked about how he loves this team so much and these seniors that he wanted to get to a Final Four um, he called Marcus Page one of those players that comes along, you know, once every many years. He's just so special. So what he said didn't surprise me because I've been hearing it. But I do think even the first time I heard him say it, it didn't surprise me because I knew how much he loved this team. And if you have anything hanging over your program, I mean, you know, I think Jim Beheim was similar just in the sense of, the negative thoughts about whether or not Syracuse belonged there. He had that same sort of demeanor about it. So those are the things that maybe coaches don't always talk about, but it's motivating them. And this is a really fun group. Pinson, I got a kick out of him uh, just this past weekend. But in that game, uh, UNC was in command for most of the game, and I think they're the favorite remaining out of the four teams in this tournament. But then Notre Dame went on their run, and then UNC fought right back. What went right when they were trying to punch back and uh, knock out the Irish? Well, it's funny. I mean, think about the first half of that game. I know North Carolina had the lead going into the half, but, and Roy said this at halftime, he was dead on, obviously. Notre Dame controlled the pace in the first half, and their goal was to, sort of to slow things down possession-wise. It's why they were using so much clock. They probably went a little too far because they were taking some shots literally just to beat the buzzer. But Notre Dame controlled the tempo and the flow of that game. They were down five. They've been a better second-half team, great defensive team, and we saw some of that when they were able to pull ahead by one. But overall, North Carolina, with its depth, with its size, and with its defense, that when they clamp down, when they get at you defensively, everything snowballs from there. And that's what we saw when they were able to pull away. Make a few stops, grab a few rebounds, 
they're off and running, and very few teams are going to be able to keep up with them because of that combination. It is the size, it is the speed, and they got contributions from players you wouldn't even have imagined. Remember, um, you know, Bryce Johnson went out right in that time where they were down by one with the technical, and, and he had three fouls. And all of a sudden, Theo Pinson, the one who's busting up the news conference the other day, becomes the star with a steal. And that steal, again, that defense, kind of got everything flowing. And that's what this team has fed off of. It's what they all talk about when they uh, revert back to that Notre Dame game in the regular season where they lost at Notre Dame. After that, they realized they had to play defense in a different way. They had to come to terms with the fact that their offense was going to flow out of this defense if they started it there. You know, that offense is limitless in so many ways, but it had to start defensively. This is Roy Williams' eighth Final Four appearance as head coach, fourth at UNC. Just because he's the most familiar with this territory, do you give the Tar Heels the edge to cut down the nets in Houston? I don't even think it's because of Roy. I think it's just some of those things that I mentioned. I think they are an incredibly deep team. I think their size is tremendous and their speed. And the flaw in them, I think they're the only thing that is the flaw. If they sort of mentally check out if they if their bigs aren't playing big you know one of the days that I was talking to Roy he was talking about how we've got 6'10 but sometimes my 6'10 plays like 6'1 if they do that if guys are getting in foul trouble early and they're not able to take advantage of that size I think that's why they get beat but otherwise I think without a doubt to me this is the most complete team of the four that we're seeing there and you've got some other you know Villanova is a really complete team too I just think North Carolina is a step beyond that and outside of the top players in this tournament, like the Marcus Pages, the Ryan Archidiakonos, even the Buddy Heels, what player has impressed you most in this tournament? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I didn't, and so I, I'm going to say this, and I don't know what he did last night because I didn't even look at the box. Malachi Richardson in the first game that we had, and maybe you think of him as too much of a name, I just think because right now we've got so many seniors that are doing well. Malachi Richardson for Syracuse can be just a game changer with his shooting ability, with his leaping ability, and he's really playing out of position right now, playing the three, and he's really a two guard. I really enjoy watching him, or I did in our in our first game especially. His second game that we had that first weekend, a little more down to earth, but, but he's certainly a fun player to watch. I think on North Carolina, it is. It's the, a Theo Pinson that all of a sudden is going to step up and make some plays like that. Um, it really, really um, was impressed yesterday because it was that moment of, look, you're put in the game. One of the most important players goes out. What can you do? So I would say those two right now are sort of my standouts. I'm kind of trying to scroll through in my, in my tired brain, but I would say those are two standouts for me. Hey, even though the brain's tired, I agree with you on Richardson because the way they just went on a 25-4 to run yesterday, Dana, it was just something I've never seen. And it wasn't like they were playing a bad team. Virginia is no, the number one seed. No, And there was a great quote that I never got to use. I was so mad. So his mom used to be the one that would go. When he, when I talked to his high school coaches, and when he was in high school, his mom used to be the one, and I think even before high school, she'd go rebound in the gym so he can shoot. And she wow. was like, there, you know, there isn't a jump shot that Malachi didn't love. He loves, he's, he's a jump shooter. But what was so impressive was they were just talking about his development. And I loved Beheim said something like, you know, he can knock down shots. There's no question about that. Now, if he could get to be as tough as his mother, that would be a great thing. So, he, you know, he's a kid that just it's all up from here. So if he can keep up what he's done already and maybe take it to that next level in this amazing stage that he's going to be on, it'll really be fun to watch. And Syracuse is a 10 seed. No one, I think, could have thought this run was coming and year after year, Jim Beheim just finds a way to block out the noise. They had all the sanctions talk uh, before the year, and probably sitting out last year ended up helping them looking back at it at the big picture. How does Coach Beheim just get his players to ignore all this noise? Because no one could have thought they would be in this spot. Well, I think it goes back to what we were talking about with, with Roy Williams a little bit. I, you know, I think that there, even though they may not admit it to us, I think there is some talk of nobody said you deserve to be here. You deserve to be here. Look at what we went through. I was out. He's really upset and, and very upset that he was taken away from his kids from that suspension earlier in the season. You know, not the, you want to punish me, find a way to punish me, but don't keep me away from my kids the entire time. They came to Syracuse to play for me. I should be able to talk with them. But I think that fuels them. I really believe that that's a part of this, that it's something to prove. And he does it because he's been doing it for so long. He knows how to help them 
sort of shut out the noise. And there's something to be said when you're trying to prove to everybody that they're wrong. Um, I think that's pretty motivating. I find it motivating when I feel that way. So I can only imagine what the Syracuse players feel. And then you get some momentum. I, you know, the big thing about Syracuse, and maybe this is talked about too much, but every coach that I talked with um, about Syracuse that was going to face Syracuse, so two coaches in the tournament, both said the difference is that 3-2 zone you don't see. You see zone defenses. You don't see that zone, and you don't see it with the players that he recruits. You know, the reason you have players playing out of position is he needs certain guys in certain places on the floor for that defense, and he gets those big, long players that make such a difference. And also with the sanctions, and I understand everyone's got to try to play on the same playing field, although I do think the NCAA is outdated with a lot of their rules. The thing that would agitate me the most, and I know he was taken away from his kids, but is the the vacating the wins. Because that's something I just never get, how they just go out there and they just try to take away history of games that we've already seen. Well, I as a as a Michigan grad, I always say, like, I watched my team in the final four. Like, I know what they're doing, I get it. I, I saw the Big Ten, like... You can take the banner down. I know what happened. You're not, you know, it's even, go back to in football, Reggie Bush. We, we saw what he did that season. We're, we're pretty well aware. You can say you don't want this to be the case anymore. Um, you know, I think it's interesting with Bayheim. So I think it was, what, 101 wins had to be vacated. He has um, a plaque up for one of the milestones, and he's kept it up. He's not taking it down. He knows what he did. The NCAA does it for their reasons, and I'm like, I understand. I don't agree with all of their rules. I don't agree with all the decisions they make and why they make them. Um, they're going to rule like that, but you're never going to take away the memories that people have. And that's, you know, maybe that's a good thing for us. The NCAA can say what they want, and fans and, and people that enjoy that team or even just fans of the game, we have our own moment. Even though Syracuse and maybe even specifically Bayheim want to stick it to the NCAA, which of these four coaches do you think has the most to prove? If you ask me, I think it's Lon Kruger because all four of these coaches have actually been to the Final Four before with their respective programs, except Kruger in 93-94 was head coach at Florida. That's when he went to the Final Four. Yeah, I mean, they all have something different to prove. I think that's what it is. I don't I, the most to prove, you know, for Roy Will, for Roy Williams, it's just a different thing to prove. He's had such a long hiatus from being there, and had maybe expected to be there earlier. Jay Wright, you know, you look at Jay Wright, and when he was supposed to go, they couldn't get first round wins, and when he went and gets to the Final Four, they can't win. He, you know, now he's got this team that I think last year they had a team that should have been able to compete and couldn't. Um, I, I, I don't know, maybe it's just being around them for so long. Even yesterday I talked about, you know, Mike Bray and Roy Williams against each other. What what was at stake? You know, for Bray it was the first ever trip to the Final Four. For Roy Williams it was about getting his kids there. So I don't, I don't know if I could even pick who I think has the most to prove because each one is on sort of writing their own legend. And, it, you know, that would be Roy Williams. It just adds to who he is and the career that he's had. So for him, there's a lot at stake as well. Wrapping up with Dana Jacobson, who joins us right now before we get her on out of here. Um, just really with this Villanova team right now, they are playing so loose. They are such a fun group to watch. Uh, they've been just shooting the lights out. I know they didn't play great against Kansas, but they still found a way to win that game, finding alternatives with guys like Oshefu. And how can't you not like uh, a player like a Ryan Arche Diacono? But now they're going up against Buddy Heald, who is uh, not being slowed down at all in this tournament. How does Villanova try to contain Buddy Heald in the Final Four? Uh, good luck. I mean, honestly, <laughs> it's it's sort of, and I have no idea how Jay Wright, I, I trust Jay Wright to come up with his approach. With a player like Buddy Heald, and granted, he's proven that he can go out there and win the game for his team, but I would think the big key with him is you've got to contain everybody else. If he's going to get his, you can't let everybody else feed off of that. I, I may be crazy, and again, I'm not, I would never pretend to be a coach and have any idea I just don't know how you slow him down. It has been so rare. I, you'd have to look back at whichever games where he was had an off night. What were they able to do? But um, it, it would just be crazy to me to think that you could even stop him to any degree. But if you prevent everybody else from beating you, um, if you prevent an Isaiah Cousins or um, Spangler or somebody like that, prevent them from doing what they do, maybe that's how you get the win. 
Dana, before we let you run, and the only reason I'm bringing this up is because uh, we were talking about it last week on the show. I'm sure you've seen it by now, uh, but there was a radio host uh, by the name of Dino Costa who said women don't belong in sports talk radio. And we were really irate with those comments, and we thought they were inane comments. Why do you think those kind of comments still happen in this industry? Um, because people have, are going to always probably have their thoughts of, of what they want or, you know, I don't know him. I didn't hear the comment. Somebody had sent the comments to me at the time. I think there are people who like to make names by making statements that they think will grab headlines and he may actually believe that. And you know what? That's his choice. I know some women that do radio that do a great job. I did it for two years. I didn't necessarily enjoy the format that I was in. I wanted to do a different kind of show. I don't think it means that women aren't meant for radio or that men don't want to listen because I hear from a lot of people that they wish that I was still on radio. Um, I think it's pretty small minded when you start saying uh, women can't be on radio. Was that was, were his comments about they're too emotional or something? I mean, really? Because I, I seem to remember on my show there was more yelling and screaming and irrational thought from men at times. So it's ridiculous. I think that was a lot of trying to grab headlines and create a story to put himself, you know, out there, to be quite honest. And I don't know him. I had a little back and forth and sort of at that point turned it off because it really wasn't worth the time. I could care less if somebody thinks I should be in radio or in sports. I enjoy doing it. Somebody's given me a job. And if you don't like it, find somebody else. That's the attitude I like because I don't know you don't need us to tell you this, but we really do enjoy your coverage and the time on the show. And I was a big fan of that show on CBS uh, Sports Radio, of course, with uh, Ray Martell producing it, and then uh, you had Tiki and Brandon. I really did like that show, but we appreciate the time today. Thanks so much, Dana. Thanks, guys. Get some rest for us, okay? I will. (laughs) There's Dana Jacobson joining us on the hotline WHIP Radio in Philadelphia. Time the WHIP Studios is 11.